I'm playing Mystic Quest. Final Fantasy Mystic Quest is the most hated Final Fantasy game. It's one of the few games that we can all agree sucks. And I'm sure you know the story about this one by now. Final Fantasy Mystic Quest was developed specifically for the US market, who at the time, according to Squaresoft, were idiots. See, the Final Fantasy franchise hadn't exploded in the West like it did in Japan, and Squaresoft thought maybe this is because Americans were too stupid to understand JRPGs. We got this instead of Final Fantasy V. So Mystic Quest was developed as an entry-level JRPG that's supposed to be super easy to understand, easy to play through, and really easy to beat. Well, apparently they thought we were even stupider than that because every game came with a copy of the full strategy guide. Japan didn't think too highly of us. So everybody hates this game and it got me wondering, is it really as bad as everyone says it is? I mean, technically, this is the first Final Fantasy game that ever got released in Europe. So, sorry about that. The game starts out instantly with danger around me as I'm on a collapsing mountain. Okay, not a bad way to start. You've got my attention. An old guy on a floating cloud tells me to follow him quickly and he explains the focus tower. Four monsters have stolen the four keys and sealed the doors of the Focus Tower, draining energy from the four crystals. The crystals represent fire, wind, water, and earth, and it's up to the hero of the great prophecy, me, to restore them. Gee, an epic RPG where you gotta collect four treasures of the elements. I've never heard that one before. Whoa, wait a sec! In the middle of talking with the old guy, a monster suddenly attacks and we get our first taste of combat. I'll go more into the combat a bit later, but this behemoth is easily killed for, you know, being a behemoth. After killing it, I asked the old man what I should do. He wants me to follow him to the level forest. Level forest? I wonder if that's going to be the forest level of the game. At the forest, talking to the old guy asks what I should do first. His response? Save the Christian of the earth! See ya! And then the main character throws out the mannerisms of an Italian used car salesman trying to convince a customer into a sale. Eh, hey, come on! This is the closest thing this game has to humor, by the way, so get ready to see this a lot. It's impossible to advance in the level forest because of all the trees, so I go to the nearby city of Foresta. In one of the tree trunk houses, which is much bigger on the inside than it is on the outside, I meet this girl. I'm Kaylee! I can chop down the tree, but monsters have taken over and I can't get to it! I can help with that! Okay, you win! And then Kaylee joins with her axe. The dialogue in this game is... impeccable. Back through the forest, we come across the evil tree and Kaylee hacks it down. But surprise, Minotaur! After swinging at him a few times, he dies, and Kaylee falls over injured because of poison. Her mom instantly shows up despite having no reason to come to the monster-filled forest on her own and takes Kaylee home. She'll give you the axe though, so now I have a new weapon. The only thing that will heal Kaylee is the elixir, which is in the nearby sand temple. Except it's not in the sand temple because some asshat named Tristam took it. And since I can't afford his asking price of 9,000 gold pieces for it, because my allowance is only 2 GP a month, I have to help him get a treasure in the bone dungeon. The Bone Dungeon is relatively uneventful, save for one part where Tristam hands over some bombs. 50 of them. I am now convinced he is a wanted criminal. Towards the end of the dungeon, I encounter the game's first major boss, the Flamorous Rex! Actually, this would be a good time to go over the game's combat. It's stupidly simple, intentionally, and that makes it suck. Animations are super basic, limited options are presented to you, and it doesn't require a whole lot of thinking enemies are very easily killed. Granted, Mystic Quest does have a thin layer of strategy on it. Some enemies are weak to certain attacks. Aside from the obvious weak against fire or lightning tropes we're used to, specific weapons can have advantages. For example, fighting a tree, an axe deals extra damage. Flying enemy, bows deal extra damage. It 
isn't much, but it does add the least bit of thought into attacking. Although the enemies are easy enough that it isn't really required for anyone. It's just faster and more convenient that way. You'll also notice that instead of hit points, there's a health meter. Square must have known that numbers are way too hard for us to read, so they made these neat little boxes to let us know how hurt we are. Now you can switch it over to a number display, but the graphic setting is the default. So by default, you look at the pretty pictures. Your max party size is two people, so you'll almost always have a partner with you. Just in case the game still requires too much thinking, you can set your partner to auto, so they'll automatically attack and cast spells. I had them set to manual the whole game because I am not an idiot. All of the enemies are visible on the map screen, so it's possible to get around some battles. I can only assume this is because Square thought beginners wouldn't grasp the concept of random battles. This is actually kind of nice because I did avoid a lot of battles, because battling isn't very fun. None of the monsters pose any kind of threat, so all you really have to do is keep pressing A and attacking until they die. The only ways they'll sometimes die is when an enemy counters and uses Petrify or other instant death abilities. But if you lose, you can continue from the beginning of the same battle without consequence, which is extremely generous. I actually found the game kind of a chore to get through because the battles weren't stimulating enough to warrant my full attention. I was always using my best attacks and rapidly pressing A while I played Fire Emblem on my 3DS up the side. It's not bad gameplay, it's just not very interesting and monotonous. The only thing I really like about the battles is weakening enemies. In Mystic Quest, as a monster takes damage, its sprite will change to reflect itself being injured. It can have two to four different states of damage. I like this, because it makes sense! I mean, think about it. In other Final Fantasy games, as your characters get weakened, they'll show it. Why not have the monsters do the same? It's encouraging. Plus, some of them just look funny as they die. Attacking a slime? <laughs> the Minotaur just gets more and more upset as he realizes his life is coming to an end. My favorites are the boss monsters, because they steadily get more and more pathetic looking. Like the Flamorous Rex here. Roar! Nah! By the way, I killed the Flamorous Rex, and I got the Earth Crystal back after a mere hour of playing! Yay! Tristan takes a grapple claw out of a chest, gives me the elixir, and leaves. Going back to Forresta, all of the trees have been restored to their lush green selves. Aww, isn't this beautiful? <laughs> Giving Kaylee the elixir, she feels better and mentions that I should visit her grandfather Spencer in the town of Aquaria. To get there, I'll need to pass through the Focus Tower. Inside of that, I once again come across the old guy on a cloud. He tells me that Captain Mac is crucial to my quest, and that a girl named Phoebe will help me. And then he zips off! Woo! Hey, come on! Inside of a temple near Aquaria, I find Phoebe, and it turns out she's super emo. Hi! It's hopeless! I give up! That explains why you're crying in the corner of an empty cave. The conversation quickly takes a U-turn and becomes stalkerish. What's your name? I'm Phoebe from Aquaria. Then I'm going with you. Phoebe helplessly joined. Aquaria sucks right now because everything is frozen, so naturally the one thing that can fix it is saving the water crystal. So myself and Phoebe head off to do so. Along the way, she hands me my final weapon type, claws. Yeah, there are only four weapon types in the game. Swords, axes, bombs, and claws. Each one has a total of three weapons in each. Same thing with the armor, four types, three upgrades in each type. You can't individually equip the different upgrades. The game automatically sets you to the best one available. You also cannot change your partner's equipment. It's one of the so-called streamlined mechanics to make the game easier to play, which makes it less interesting. Nearly every weapon, armor piece, and spell is found in treasure chests throughout the world, making all the money you get from battles kind of worthless. There's only a few pieces of equipment you can buy, and they'll only cost a few hundred gold pieces when you'll have thousands. There are no item, weapon, or armor shops at all either. Some people will sell healing items like cure potions, heal potions, or magic point seeds, but you'll never, ever have to buy them. Throughout the whole game, there are these brown boxes which contain these curative items, and every time you leave an area and come back, they'll respawn. It doesn't take much effort to get as many items as you need without having to spend a dime. This is something that is made way too easy. I have the money to buy things, just let me do that so I feel like I earned something in this game. So I speed through the ice pyramid, fight some stuff, fight the ice golem, and melt his ass. I got the water crystal back! Yay! 
Aquaria is back to normal, and I find Spencer underground. He's doing some tunneling or something, and he says that Captain Mac has been researching the prophecy of the hero, aka me, but got stuck in a dried up lake. Spencer gives me a key to get further through the focus tower. Inside of the tower, who else is there but the crazy old guy who says I should find Reuben in Fireberg, and then zoom! Eh, what the hell? Fireberg is a weird place. There's a hotel with a big neon sign on it, so despite all evidence to the contrary, they do have electricity discovered by now. Inside there's a band playing on stage, and you can listen to their really dumb, awkward song? Tristan is inside of here too, for some reason. Must be for the music. Anyway, I find Ruben, and he says that he can't help me until he saves his dad, who is trapped by a boulder. The boulder can only be destroyed by mega grenades, and there's only one guy in town who knows how to use them. But he's locked himself inside of his own house! Naturally, I ask Tristan if he'll lockpick the house for us. Instead, he just gives me his multi-key, which opens up any locked thing in the world. Really, dude? You just hand those out? Inside of the guy's house, he immediately hands over the mega grenades that only he knows how to use to save Tristam's dad. How do you use it? Just throw it! Really? That's it? You're the only person in the world who uses mega grenades and the big secret is just to throw them? Ugh. Ruben and I head towards his father, which requires going through a mine and fighting some enemies. Okay, this has really been bothering me and I gotta point it out. Every single time you join up with a partner, they're better than you. Always. They'll always be a higher level, always have better weapons, and they will always do more damage than you can. That's bullshit! You're supposed to be the hero of the prophecy, the savior of the world, but every single person who helps you is simply better than you are? You hold them back. They're carrying you. You're the dead weight here, hero. Anyway, we find his dad and throw the grenade to knock the boulder loose and save his life. Hooray! Oh, oh god, oh god, no. I'm sure the thousands of plants, animals, and people we just crushed is justifiable collateral damage to save this one guy, right? Ruben agrees to go with me to get the fire crystal inside of the volcano, because where else would it be? Inside, we kill some fire things, pink ninjas, and we get to the fire boss, which is a hydra. After killing it, we get the fire crystal back. Yay! Ruben mentions that he heard the wind crystal might be at a town called Windia. On the way to Windia, we go across a bridge, but suddenly a mummy appears from behind and he's all like, Gotcha! Ruben says he'll handle it and promptly gets his ass kicked and he dies. Nah, just kidding, he's okay. Mere seconds later, Tristram shows up again and rejoins once more. On the way to Windia, we end up in the Alive Forest, which is redundant to say because trees are living things. Unless, of course, ah! <laughs> Fuck you, nature! So we can't pass forward at all because of the great Deku tree here, and he won't talk to us. But he would totally talk to a tree hippie like Kaylee, so we need to get her back in Aquaria. Before I go on, I want to talk about the world map traveling, or really, the lack thereof. Previous Final Fantasy games had expansive worlds that you could freely explore, go to places you weren't supposed to yet, find vast treasures, and have a sense of freedom. Mystic Quest once again simplifies this by forcing you to go from point to point, like picking levels in Super Mario World or something. There is zero exploration or freedom. The most they have for extra things to do are battlegrounds. Each one of these battlegrounds has 10 battles inside of them, and clearing them out usually nets you minor rewards, like gold, experience, sometimes an item, or one specific one gives you the exit spell. Much like nearly every other battle, these require no thought to complete, and for the most part, they're better left ignored. Simply select your best attacks or spells, and you'll win. I swear, I won these fights by repeatedly pressing the A button just slightly less times than you would in Final Fantasy XIII. ZING! Back in Aquaria, Spencer says he hasn't been able to dig towards Captain Mac's ship at all. Suddenly, he and Tristram get distracted by non-specific treasure and then run off together. But not before Tristram gives you the Dragon Claw. Phoebe gets mad that Spencer can't get through the tunnel, and instead uses a bomb to clear it out. Which makes the whole thing collapse. Basically, she ruins everything, says, whoops, and then leaves. Yeah, I know how you feel, buddy. With all of that out of the way, I go to get Kaylee so she can talk to the Great Deku Tree. She rejoins and- What the crap?! Level 31?! You were sick and sleeping most of the damn time! How did you get so much better?! See what I mean that everyone is better than you in this game?! 
So I take her overpowered ass and she talks to the tree. And he says he'll let us pass if we clear the monsters out from inside of him. So he opens up his mouth and oh my god, he is the Great Deku Tree. He even has tinier, eviler trees inside of him. With the Dragon Claw upgraded, it can now be used as a grappling hook to get past some areas. That's one of the few other things this game did that's kinda neat. The weapons have overworld uses. The sword can activate switches, the axe cuts down trees, bombs blow open doorways, and the claws let you climb and hookshot. It isn't much, honestly, but it's better than nothing. Clearing out all the tree enemies has them walk you over to Windia. You can tell it's windy here because of the flapping windows. Hey look, a chocobo! See, it's totally Final Fantasy! Inside the town is a crazy inventor named Otto, which is a completely missed opportunity to call him Sid, and his daughter is trapped up on the mountain because of the strong winds. So we go to Mount Gale to fix that, which has one of the most boring color schemes in the game. We get to the boss and he's pretty nonchalant about things. So you're the one who's draining the Crystal of Wind's power! Nah, it's Pazuzu! And then you fight. Now I've heard of the Headless Horseman, but the Headless Horseman with the Headless Horse? How do they know where they're going? He dies and Otto's daughter isn't there. To make her way to Pazuzu's tower, Otto uses a machine to create the Rainbow Road. Mario Kart joke. Inside Pazuzu's tower, you find the daughter Norma instantly and she walks home. You gotta do a bunch of dumb stuff in the tower with some switches and then you fight Pazuzu. Just like everybody else, he's pretty easy to kill, except when he puts up his Psyche Shield which reflects magic attacks. Wait a second! A boss? That has tactics? That requires me to put forethought and timing into my attacks? Holy hell, we have the makings of a real fight for once! And it only took the game four-fifths of the way through to make it happen! So he dies, I get the Wind Crystal, and everybody you know is back in Windia. They drain the water from a different lake to get Captain Mac's ship afloat again, and after fighting a few things to get to him, Mac tells you more of the prophecy. He's discovered a lost part that tells of a ringleader of the Four Fiends who took the crystals, known as the Dark King, and that he's at the top of the Focus Tower. So Phoebe rejoins me once again, and we take the ship to the final part of the Focus Tower. The Focus Tower pulls out your typical lazy game design of making you refight previous bosses, only now they're easier with less hit points. Skullrus Rex, another Golem, a Fire Wyvern, a Pazuzu clone, killed all of them. I eventually come to a statue of myself, which has some blinking lights, and the crystals tell me they're entrusting me with their power. Their power doesn't do squat, by the way. The most it does is let you open up some chests for things you don't need. Thus, we come up to the final boss, the madman behind all of this world carnage, the Dark King. But he reveals a big plot twist. It was he who started the prophecy about himself ages ago! Well, aren't you an attention whore? The Dark King doesn't really do a whole lot of damage against you. And as you battle him, he slowly begins to reveal his true form. From a Dark King, to a Dark King with a lot of arms, to a giant spider. But the game has trained me for this very moment. I muster every ounce of strength I have, devise every strategy I could use for victory, and strike with valor in every swing. His weakness is cure. I don't know why or for what reason, but it absolutely murders him. Sure, you could cast your most powerful wizard spell, Flare, and do about 2,000 damage against him. Or you could cast Cure on him and deal about 18,000. So for a final boss, he didn't take too long to beat. Phoebe and I rejoice over his death, and the old guy appears once more. He shows his true form as the Crystal of Light, and pats himself on the back for guiding me all the way here. He then says some stupid crap about enjoying the world that we have, and then leaves forever. From here, we find out what will happen to the lovable cast of characters we have grown to vaguely know over the game. Don't care, don't care, don't care, don't care. The final scene is the hero taking Captain Mac's ship, because he wants more adventure in his life and everybody says goodbye to him. The hero finally sets off, ready to leave, but wait! Tristan suddenly appears on the boat because he heard there might be treasure on this adventure! And finally, credits. I know it doesn't seem like much, but this game was really hard to play through, mostly because I could feel my brain slowly becoming mush as I was playing it. That's why my final rating for this game is a training wheel out of 10. It does what it's supposed to, get you ready for the real thing. But Final Fantasy Mystic Quest suffers from something of an identity crisis. It's way too easy for RPG fanatics, and RPG newbies can find all of the hand-holding almost discouraging from trying other RPGs. 
The gameplay is too basic to be enjoyable by anyone except for the most naive of players. The story is just stupid. The graphics lack life or emotion, save for the dying monsters. And the music, while okay, it's nowhere near as good as other games in general. At least it's short. You can beat it in about 10 hours. I guess it can introduce the concept of RPGs to new players at the most basic levels, but just like training wheels on a bike, you wouldn't want to be caught with this, and it's nowhere near as fun as the real thing. Mystic Quest is not a very good game, but it's not offensive like a lot of people make it out to be. Honestly though, I'm surprised we got this game at all. Square probably came to the US and was all like, Hey, yo, you want this game? And America was like, mm, I don't know. And then Square was like, Eh, hey, come on! Hey, thanks for watching. You're still here, so I imagine you still have some boredom you'd like to kill. So you can go ahead and murder something that boredom with the Pocky and Rocky video over on the left, or you could learn how to play the Japan-only Final Fantasy trading card game over on the right. Or if you'd like, you could subscribe to me, that way when I put out new videos in the future, you can kill your boredom there. Like premeditated murder. And I'll be your accomplice. Oh, don't murder anyone.